Welcome to a brand new episode of The Cooligans. I mentioned last week that Alexis was going to be away this week and we would we would have some guest co-hosts and we have uh, the homie who came through again always. Whenever Alexis is letting us down, traveling away with his wife, you know what I mean? Christine Koopa will always step in. So, Christine, thank you so much for joining You're me. You're so welcome. The price of the brick <laughs> is going off. <laughs> I'm like, That's I need it. like Alexis supplemental cash at this point. <laughs> I need the Gu- Guerrero's book. <laughs> that Guerrero's, it's, a, it's the new cryptocurrency. Everybody's <laughs> buying it. Uh, Just the Alexis' the, space on Monopoly money. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, we would do the show in studio, but unfortunately, the, the Rona is back, everybody. So I, I got it. I got it. It's, it, it's, it's a little, uh, you know, we all thought it was over. We all, you know, we're all uh, um, picketing and supporting Robert F. Kennedy Jr. uh, Because my my man doesn't believe in this whole thing. Uh, But it is real. I tested positive. So we're doing the show remotely. I feel fine. Luckily, uh, everybody's fine. Um, But yeah, that is why we're doing the show uh, uh, from home. And and you, I'm doing the show from home. You're doing the show from Charlie Davies uh, uh, office studio at CBS. So did Charlie make it his own? Because I see the the his his jersey back there in the frame. So technically, this is Charlie's room. I'm uh-huh. now squatting, but um, <laughs> with the call it what you want gang, they tend to pop in here to do their pod now. So he's right. sharing with uh, it's a brotherhood of podcasting. So well, th- uh, thank you. Now uh, he's got <laughs> me, and sometimes Lisa will pop in here too. So, <laughs> so very kind of of Charlie to share uh, the space that was originally not his own, but he has definitely he put his graffiti all over. He tagged the place. It is oh, his. Yeah. Clearly, we've got we've got his boots in here that you could see that actually have his name on him too. I'm just I a, love I'm it. an advert for Charlie Davies right now. It's fine. <laughs> Chuck's a good egg. Um, so we got a lot to go over uh, today. Um, obviously, the uh, the U.S. men's national team Olympic roster uh, 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 just came out. We'll talk about the women's national team uh, uh, Olympic roster as well, because obviously Christine Cupo uh, is uh, uh, one of the hosts of, of Attacking Third on CBS Sports Golasso. Uh, so we'll uh, get to a lot of Woso news on top of uh, Euros and Copa America uh, as well. But let's start with the Olympic roster for the men um because now uh this is I mean, look not 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 too many shocks um but really the main one is about diego luna diego luna uh, uh the rsl uh midfielder who rejected being an alternate for the olympic roster he said like no if you're not gonna have me on the first team I don't even want to go. I don't even want to be there, uh, which is not, maybe not. I don't know. From, from from a business perspective, I don't know how you really get in good graces with uh, uh, with U.S. soccer. But that was his decision. Even after he rejected the call up, he um, uh, well, he ended up getting three assists and one goal. So he he's basically letting the the you know what what he does on the pitch speak for itself. Um, but yeah, so th- let's let's just start there. That um, you know him getting left off the roster. Uh, first reactions to that? Um, you know, sometimes, especially with Olympic rosters, tough decisions have to be made because it's a whittled down roster. And mm-hmm. more often than not, you're going to go for tried and true, but you're also going to go for versatility. So that way, if you're in a pinch, you can slide somebody around. So sometimes those who can function more, more multifacetedly um, will get the nod. I don't think it was in Diego Luna's best interest to... to um, decline the invite in general. I think that sometimes they see that maybe you're lacking something that they think you can pick up in international experience, even from a training capacity. Um, it also could have been a test to see if he gelled well with the existing squad. And yeah. it doesn't really say much for him in terms of is he a team player that he took it that way? Because you need to be able to think of the good of the whole, not just of yourself. Is it wildly disappointing as a player? Yes. Do you always want to be part of an Olympics, of a World Cup? Yes. But I think that it shows uh, humility um, in how you take bad news and your growth and maturity as a player. And I think that this just doesn't bode well for him. Yeah. I mean, the way he takes uh, bad news is by score- getting three assists and a goal. Uh, so and that's another- fine. <laughs> but like, do you have what it takes to have chemistry with your teammates, to yeah. not be selfish, to think of of everyone else? 
as a unit versus your wants and needs. It just it's a, it's interesting because he he's had like negative. I mean, I, I don't know if you've come across any uh, of. He he's done a couple of like post match uh, press conferences and, and stuff like that, or like um, training interviews and stuff like that. And he they've asked him about this, and he does not speak very hot. No, I don't really say that doesn't speak highly. He you can see the contention in when they ask him about uh, uh, playing for the uh, men's national team at, at the Olympics or at any level. He doesn't. He you can hear the like yeah I've had a lot of arguments with my partner. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to be respectful as possible, but you hear him like he has to get it out through like as he's grinding his teeth because you, you can see the, the frustration and, and getting I'm, I'm sure he's received lots of bad news. And maybe it's also with like senior call ups as well. And so it, it just it, it's it stands it all stands out more because he's playing so well and RSL are doing so, so well. Uh, him, uh, Chicho Arango, everybody, the, the, they got the fastest Colombian people on the <laughs> in MLS and they're dominating and they're doing really, really well, obviously in the Western conference. So the, uh, I, and I think the point that you m mentioned about the versatility of these players, because the like uh, players like Kevin, Kevin Paredes, who, who plays left back, left wing back. Uh, he's played on the right wing sometimes for, for the U S men's national team, the senior team. Uh, so it's uh, it, it, given that the Olympic roster is only 18 players. Yes, this is be, this becomes an issue because, you know, somebody gets injured and then you need uh, you know, you don't have that that uh, like breadth of options uh, on the bench. You just need to like, hey, if you're if you're on the pitch and you are you, you are playing right wing, but you could also play left back. Hey, yeah, get back there. Uh, we'll we'll bring somebody it, up. Yeah, as much as it's high stakes with World Cup, you have a little bit more wiggle room in terms of mm -hmm. if you wanted to give a player a look and include them on the roster, um, if they are just like a really solid center back or something to that effect, like you have the room to do it. It's just a matter of like how much risk you want to take on. But with the Olympics, it's very bare bones. You need to be very strategic in how you select and why you select. And yeah, something like um, uh, personality or behavior and things like that will be something that will red flag. That'll be like, well, will this mess with team chemistry? Do we want to have this person? Whatever. And Unfortunately, like that could have been a trial that they were trying to put him through. And now he's declined, which doesn't do him any favor. Right. And th so so the U.S., uh, their first game <coughs> is against France in um, uh, at, at the Olympics. And I, it's interesting. And we'll talk about the women uh, as well, because obviously the the expectations are probably much, much higher uh, for the women, given that they've obviously won gold before. Um, but the men, I I'm I'm. It's hard to it's hard to exactly judge because the last time the U.S. Uh, uh, played France in a friendly, I think it was a, a, a youth friendly and I think it was 2-2. Um, so th it's one of these things where this, the, the senior teams don't necessarily represent like what happens at, at the, the younger levels of like what right. the, re the results are going to be. You yeah. hear, oh, Argentina's playing in the Olympics and it's like, well, but that doesn't mean they're going to win. They're not. They, they, there's the, the, the level. This is where we, we always sort of talk about that the level around this age, like under, I would say probably under 20 is kind of even. And then something happens in other countries that has, does not happen in the U S where it is just like, we can't, uh, what is like, what happened from like, you know, 19 to 22, maybe it's college. We shouldn't be going to, I don't know. Now, we're, I, we're, I, I we're think reading I would, too many books. I would argue <laughs> that it's, Something that happens before then, because you can kind of see players that are going to be something special much earlier in their development, like a Pulisic. You could see him. He was playing up by at least three years, even when he was in camp. So um, there are definitely identifying factors when you're scouting and just reviewing players. But yeah, I think that what we're seeing maybe that you're pointing out is like a little bit of a ledge where it's like, oh, okay, maybe this is the feeling that we're creating and they're not actually growing as much as other countries are in the same respect. Yeah, I mean, but even the American coaches, when they saw Pulisic, they were like, ah, he'll never make it. He's too small. Look at his little little twerp. And then look there what ends up no, happening. There were a bunch <laughs> of proponents for Pulisic. He definitely had eyes yeah. on. He didn't go under the radar at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but there, there was that negativity. And that still sort of is with I like think smaller there's always players. Gonna be, yeah, but I always think there's going to be a little bit of a chip on the shoulder when you think about just the coaching and the systems that we've had had that have been largely tipped in favor of uh, yeah. foreigners coming to coach Americans. 
And whether or not they want to explicitly address it, there's always going to be a little bit of a bias where it's like, you know, you're harder on them, but then the really good players that we managed to cultivate um, are that much better. Well, I think uh, one of the players uh, that was that 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 talent was identified at a very, very, very early age, even earlier than I think I've ever seen. Is Did you see those photos with y- Lamine Yamal uh, with Lionel yes. Messi? See, I call it the <laughs> baptism by Messi because I'm sorry, but like it's so um, the symbolism of it entirely of like bathing him. I'm like, right. I'm about to take I'm about to take. Mateo to Miami. I'm about to take my 15 month old son to Miami and said, "All right, I, I know this sounds strange, Lionel Messi, but I'm gonna need you. I'm gonna I'm gonna put him in a pool of water. I'm gonna need you to bathe this this kid, okay? Because I I'm, I need any blessing. <laughs> Daddy needs to retire, babe. <laughs> okay, I can only do this for maybe 12 more years. Okay, you gotta you gotta. This is an investment, Lionel. Uh, real talk. I when I initially saw those photos, I thought they had to be ai it right, was the right. first time i've ever been like is this deep fake that deep like let me go check this out um <laughs> it's such a wild storyline like it's so there's incredible no world in which i could have possibly anticipated that that would come out yeah. this year during like copa america <laughs> and be like wait a minute what right right and like, then does the, messi I... remember this <laughs> How if many children have, not... have you bathed, Messi? Are we going to see them come up in the academy system? <laughs> is there? Yeah, it's just like is there? Is this like a a, a service you provide a business? <laughs> uh, but <laughs> because uh, so if people are not aware, do you uh, mean Lamina- that? <laughs> Please, is it too late? <laughs> okay. I could be great. I, I okay, I'm sure there's adult little pools that we can. <laughs> I'm here for my messy (laughs) baptism. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. You look, the Pope is Argentinian. There's no reason Lionel can't be next in line. Um, the so if you are not aware, uh, Lamina Ma, obviously the, the the winger for Spain who's uh, doing great at, at the Euros, uh, was a part of a charity calendar from UNICEF, uh, which also why is UNICEF doing a charity calendar? I mean, they can. There's w- other ways to fundraise, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, Exploiting but, the youth, the underprivileged <laughs> youth, as everyone does. It's, it's, it's capitalism three point <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a nonprofit, right? But they gotta, they have to get donations any way they can. Uh, Lamin, adorable little baby, love little little pudgy cheeks. The the interesting thing little is like comb over. <laughs> the comb over. The the interesting thing is like the, what basically Lamin. It's like you can't sort of guess what babies are gonna look like when they become adults. Like L- Lamin, for whatever the, the baby Lamin looks like for some reason he's so chubby and adorable that like his chubby cheeks cover his neck like he has no neck sort of and then now babies (laughs) unpopular (laughs) opinion most babies just look like chubby potatoes like it's just they're (laughs) nondescript shapes and lulls and then but now my man has a neck like a swan he has like a beautiful (laughs) neck and the neck came out way later so if anybody's worried about their neck if they're uh, if there are kids listening don't worry, the neck shows up you're, you're at some not, point. Your neck will emerge before your 16th birthday, <laughs> roughly. Good luck. <laughs> okay, just just hold on. I know you might, you know, people might mention it. Okay, you might you may not like how you look in pictures, but bro, this was that that was such a wild <laughs> moment. Um, anyway. So shout out to uh, uh, Lamine and Messi for being a part of that. Um, let's get to uh, real quick the uh, the women's roster, and this is where I think the the expectations, like I said, were I think a little bit higher. Um, the I, I spoke about it with Alexis. I don't know how much it, it sort of come up at, uh, at uh, you know on attacking third, but obviously the 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 controversial decision of I was obviously to bring uh Corbin Albert but the 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 interesting I, and we we saw this everybody has talked about it ad nauseum it's not really about whether she should or should not be on the team it's like look we we accept the the the, the statements that they've made I I'm I'm personally not 100% happy with it but I, you know arguing with with who arguing at the internet is not going to necessarily be uh, uh productive at least for me does it make me feel better but the the thing I do enjoy is that they are it, it's opening up the women's national team to just literally like being roasted. There's there's TikToks, there are stories, everybody sort of having a good time, sort of uh, teasing uh, Corbin about the, her inclusion uh, on the team. But 
I, I guess my main question to you is, is it, is it a distraction at all? Do you think it affects these players in any way? Um, because the, the, the sense I get is that the players, um, it, you know, we've seen, you know, we've seen like Lynn Williams, we've seen Sam Mewis talk about it and, and players that are on this team. We've seen their statements. It's, it feels to me that the conversations have been had. They've, they've told her how they feel. They told her what they felt she did wrong. And again, we haven't heard anything from Corbin herself. But again, it, I, I, I am also trying to be conscious of the fact like, was she 19 or something like that? Like 20? I, She's I, young. I mean, that aside, yeah. uh, irrespective of her age, I can say with utmost certainty that beyond her liking and like reposting of those really just incendiary and inappropriate um, posts, is that U.S. soccer getting involved and intervening, you would not get a statement out of her. The edict would be like, you issue an apology in however you think you see fit, and that'll be the end of it. Because nothing that you can say going forward is going to rectify that, quite frankly. Um, Emma Hayes has made it clear that she uh, intends to uphold the existing culture of um, openness and uh, inclusivity And with that, we have to entrust that the conversations that needed to be had and the work that she's been trusted to do, and by her, I mean Corbin, um, will get done. But also, it's an indoctrination. So with that, it takes time to undo that. Culture changes slowly. We've seen the quickest shift in culture more broadly within the last five years, and it's been unprecedented. So with that being said, our U.S. women's national team would effectively represent that myth and also juxtaposition in a lot of cases of views and upbringings. And as long as you are outwardly accepting um, and kind and or figure out how to get that done, if you are somebody that has maybe some outlier view, um, that's kind of a microcosm of our current political and climate in the U.S. So to me, it makes a lot of sense that like, yeah, of course, you'd end up with like one person or two. But with that being said, you could also figure out a way to work through whatever it is that you think are deeply held beliefs. And that's on her. That aside, like there are other conservative U.S. women's national team players that just managed to not project <laughs> not, their own. You know what I mean? Like they don't feel not, over, well, overly compelled to be hateful to other people or make comments or be suggestive in any way. And I think that that is that is culturally accommodating. But right. like for her to do the work, it's fun. Is Corbin a good player? Yes. Do was she chosen for her ability to play on field? Yes. Do I think that she would have been included had she had given a different performance or interacted with her teammates otherwise um, in the prior friendly? No. I think that that was a trial and conversations were had and things were moved on beyond that. Um, I think we haven't this is we haven't seen we haven't we have seen this before with like Hinkle going back. And the difference there was she refused to wear the shirt. She wouldn't represent the rainbow kit. She wouldn't, she wanted no part of any of it. And I think that where we see a deviation here is that Corbin was receptive, wore it, whatever. Um, is the booing affecting her? Yeah. Should it? Yeah. Actions have repercussions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's a, um, it, it's an interesting, um, sort of dynamic because, I think the main problem is that we're not satisfied with one, the fact that we haven't heard anything directly from her. And then also the fact that U.S. soccer is sort of playing point when it comes to defending her behavior in some way and not defending her behavior, but really just like saying like she's doing the work and so on and so forth. So there's something that is just it's just not satisfying because obviously a lot of uh, communities are hurt by what she and it's also like yeah she hurt like L- the lgbt community but also as a straight dude i'm just like wow, it's also sucks i mean so it's like why is it why is this yeah. why are you so loud about this it's sort of like we have had a conservative uh, uh players that represent the national team but they they we all we all know the game everybody's like i right, i gotta go to work let me just keep this to myself. Yeah. Like, let's just keep yeah. it a buck. <laughs> I think I think that part I do attribute a lot to like youth and just legitimately, to put it bluntly, being an idiot and being like, yeah, yeah. oh, that's entertaining to me. I think there were 
multitudes of worry included in that because like not only was like transphobic anti lgbtqi plus but also like the fact that you are somehow finding joy in a, a teammate or a former teammate potential team whatever in rapino's injury um is just like it's gross doubly wor- it's, right like it just I was, is i was in san diego i was in san diego for the for the final and when Megan Rapino went down and injured in like the third minute of the game, I was literally heartbroken. I was just like, this is the worst. Like, you know, because we were all building up to the Ali Krieger, Megan Rapino final and who was going to win and all this other stuff. And for it, for it to end, for her career to end in that, there was nothing. I'm a comedian and I'm like not even thinking about making jokes in that moment because it right. was like. You know, we, we've we met Megan Rapinoe. We know her, obviously. So, we, uh, you know, I think we have a different perspective. But the but still, she's just like a hero to so many. Myself even if included. She weren't, even if she weren't a hero, you never celebrate someone else's injury. Of period. course. Period. Yeah. period. Like, especially <laughs> when you are a player and you understand how valuable that time is for you as a player. It just is so it's just distasteful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh. So I mean, the, the I, I want to talk about their actual play on the field. Yeah, I, I, I know what ends up happening is uh, you know, and I get caught up in this too because there is a lot of like uh, uh it's entertain the drama is entertaining. Okay, I watch I watch uh, Love Island like every red blooded uh, British person. Okay, <laughs> so I apparently have not red blooded or British. <laughs> I don't watch reality TV, but everybody's been trying to sell me on Love Island lately. I don't know what I, it is. I, I, I mean, it's a wildly, it's just another reality show where hot people are trying to hook up and they say dumb stuff to each other. And it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, it's, there's a formula and it works. Okay. So they, that's what they're doing. Um, but the, the so the uh, actual play, I'm, I'm, um, the, the, the last Olympics, uh, were bad. Well, we lost to Sweden, I believe. I forgot who we I lost mean, to. We bronzed. So bronzed yeah, could have okay, been yeah. better. Could have been better. Yeah, it's not yeah. like we didn't medal at all, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, it was a lackluster performance. It, it, the the last the last uh, Olympics felt a little bit like um, you know th- that that older generation was sort of still there, and you could sort of feel like, hey, this is I think this is it. Obviously, uh, with Rapino being there, uh, did Carly Lloyd play on that team as well? I don't remember on the last. I think she was. I feel I like she was, but also that was a weird year because it was COVID Olympic, so we right, got right, postponed. Right. Like, there's a myriad of things that just like did yeah. not. So, but it, it just so. like it. It, it just, especially after winning um, uh, the World Cup, you we just the expectations were just like, oh, okay, this is it's going to be this again. And it I was think not. the expectations have always been very high because the women's program has always been exemplary. So the expectation is always they will rise to the occasion and they will figure it out. I think when we started to see at that last Olympic where they weren't, they were a shadow of themselves, and it just didn't seem like they were gelling. They couldn't really get things to work, and um, things are going wrong. It just, I don't know. It was probably one of those like data points that you kind of pin and go, ooh, oh, is this, this is bad. Yeah. Is it like the beginning of the end kind of a thing? Or, you know, all the questions, you know, people are asking those questions during the, during the Women's World Cup of, of like, um, have, have, has everybody caught up? You know, the other countries, have they caught up? But I, I was sort of asking that during the Olympics because that's what it kind of felt like. Um, but the, the U.S. is playing against um, uh, their first game is against Germany. Uh, their next uh, the second is against Guinea. And then the third is against Australia. So that's a pretty that's not an easy group by any means. Um, I don't think uh, Sa- Sam Kerr, she's she's not healthy yet. She's not playing. I don't think she is. Right? Uh, no, I don't think I don't she's think back. She is. I'd have, have to double I check. I feel like no, not yet. Although, it's only been like eight or nine months since she got yeah, injured. She'll, she'll be back for uh, for regular the, season. Sure. I don't know if she's back for the Olympics. I don't think so. So that game, Somebody the game back against... check me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, producer Andrew, get on it. Um, then... It's the, the, the game against Germany, I think, is going to be very, uh, very telling. It, you know, like, like always, uh, the U.S. Women's National Team is always... You know, they have a target on their back. All the other countries are always going to play um, their best game against them. Um, and I, I, there, there's something to this team um, and just these this group of younger players, even more than the um, the, the World Cup squad. Um, it, it's it's significantly younger. Um, there is there are a few veterans, but it's really now we're so, we're going to see where our young players 
minutes or stack up to these other countries' young players and and to see if that development has happened. I mean, I love seeing that Rose Lavelle is like an unbelievable form now uh, with Gotham. Um, and and then the other thing I, I've I asked this, you know, I brought this up to Alexis before. And the the one player that I that I love and adore and I love watching her play, but that I think has underwhelmed for the the national team has been Trinity Rodman. There's there's to me not enough assists. Not enough goals, not not enough huge chances created, especially against like these the, the friendlies that 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 uh, we've had that where we should dominate and you know and, and we're playing at home and and whatever. I haven't seen enough of it. Is that is that a, a wild take? Because it's it's for, I don't know if it's just me. I just want I want more. Yeah, I think it's a little bit. Um, you're going a little hard on her more so than she deserves. Uh, Trinity. Okay. That top line has so much chemistry and they play together with such intensity and joy. So when you look at like Sophia Smith and Val and everybody kind of firing on all pistons now, um, Trinity is more than just goals and assists. She's great off the ball. She's a very smart player. Um, she definitely helps in that work, in that work up and she knows where she needs to be. Um, I don't, I wouldn't change that at all. I feel like they're probably one of the more exciting, younger, brighter spots of our, our, our spot. I agree. And, and, and we've seen the goals from Jaden Shaw. We've seen the goals, uh, um, from, uh, Mallory Swanson. And I don't, I don't know if I'm just crazy. I just feel like th- that, you know, Trinity should be getting, she, she should be eating as well. Story That's all of, I- <laughs> like sometimes it's just a matter of being unselfish. Maybe. But, um, she definitely is involved up there. I don't know. Uh, okay, that's fair. I mean, look, I, I, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, not having uh, uh, Mallory Swanson at the World Cup, I think was that was very, very telling. We sort of saw that we didn't really have that many ideas uh, up front, but so I think it's going to be very different because she's also uh, looking great uh, for the Red Stars. Uh, she's looking as well. amazing for the Red yeah. Stars. She's yeah. right now top five in the Golden Boot race. She is so sharp. Uh, I think we expected there to be more of a runway for her to kind of get back into playing, but she just, it's excellent. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So, um, I, I'm, a, look, I don't know if I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to say they deserve, they, they should be winning gold, but I think they should be in the final. This team should be good enough. I mean, we we saw the teams at the World Cup that obviously uh, uh, did very very well, and obviously Spain. We saw the uh, Emma Hayes at after Chelsea won uh, uh, the title, the WSL, and and basically they asked her, "Oh, like what are you gonna do next?" It's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go. I have to figure out how to beat uh, uh, the Spanish somehow, right?" And yeah. So finally, she's, she's having fun with it. Um, but this is. I think the Olympics is where we're really going to, you know, we've seen Emma Hayes already managing in, in, uh, uh, in friendlies and stuff like that. But when it, when it matters, when the pressure is on, that's uh, it's, you know, it's just very, very different. Um, uh, You know, as far as the, the, the intensity that even that the players bring that the, the, the coaching staff brings. So I'm excited to see what it's going to look like in that first game. And uh, when, uh, when's the first game? Uh, May, Oh, not May. Uh, July July twenty seventh, eighth, oh, whatever. It's oh yeah, twenty like, eighth. I now have like the summer series and also the Olympic flooring together in my brain. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so J- July twenty eighth at twenty one hundred o'clock. I don't know what yeah. time that is. Okay, so, <laughs> twenty one hundred hours. <laughs> I I'm American. I do, if it's not written in Fahrenheit, I'm I supposed to know? Okay. <laughs> so, all right, uh, we got to get to uh, Copa America and uh, Euros. Uh, so we'll t- we'll talk about that uh, right after this. All right, we are in the midst of Copa America and the Euros. Uh, where are we? Semifinals for both. Um, let's start with Copa America and the fact that. Canada just making us 
making CONCACAF, making U.S. look look like they're in the in the mud, okay? Because Jacob Jesse... Schlappelberg, remember the name, like, as we've always Yo, known. What? Schaffel, Schaffelberg was holding his own, bro. Like, you know, these Coleman Bowl dudes, they try to, you know, push the CONCACAF boys around, and it's just like, yeah, they were holding their own. They were, they were, they were throwing, you know, they were diving when necessary. You know, we know the game. We know how it's done out in South America. Um, but Canada defeats Venezuela in penalties and uh, and move on, uh, which is I can <laughs> literally nobody saw this coming. <laughs> and, <laughs> Not and it's, the storyline I would have written. I'm gonna right, be honest. So I, I, I but let, I mean, we have to pull up this clip because when Alexis asked me how do I think Canada is going to do at Copa America? You know what I said? I said they are not going to win one game. I said they wouldn't win any. They're going to get bounced out immediately. I said Jesse Marsh, he barely even knows these guys' names. He doesn't know what he's doing out there. And, oh, like, oh, yeah, but like okay. remember, <laughs> even if they all don't show up, but like Fonzie does, like at least the mm -hmm. back line is locked down. So like maybe sure. you'll bleed gold. But I mean, <laughs> all right, Christian. <laughs> yeah. I don't I look I was talking crazy. I was I was look, I'll be honest. I was going for clicks, bro. I, I was I wanted to upset all of Canada. You were so just they, being a hate <laughs> skater. Did you wear fall denim while you did this? <laughs> okay. Like the Justin Timberlake Britney outfit, like hat, <laughs> death, pants, all denim. That's see, that's what Justin Timberlake should have been wearing in his mugshot. <laughs> That's what he should have been wearing, okay? <laughs> okay, because this is, you know, it's going to ruin the tour, My all right? My world tour, Christian, my world <laughs> tour. Um, but the fact that, uh, and and this is the other thing, I mean, and uh, um, Jesse Marsh has been, you know, chatting, uh, he's been doing interviews with, with, with our boy, your, your co-worker, uh, uh, Jimmy Conrad, uh, who's who's doing uh, you know the the coverage for for Fox uh, of um, of the Euros and Copa America, and and but you see this you see the smirk on Jesse's face. It's it is like um mm, yeah you you wish you were talking to somebody else right now, huh? Jesse <laughs> had been very very outspoken um, as an analyst, um, yeah, yeah. and critical of Greg openly. Um, when he had done work on just the men's national team. So, yeah, it does feel a little bit like, hey, <laughs> huff my chest out. Like, I let's... love it because even as soon as, even when Jesse uh, uh, took the job at CBS and started and was on the podcast on Call It What You Want, Jesse Marsh has probably been in that room that you are in right now. <laughs> <laughs> and he, Am and everybody. I the manager of Canada now? <laughs> <laughs> you are next. You are next in <laughs> next line, Kubo. Line. Um, but the fact that uh, that that Jesse Marsh uh, has has essentially, I mean, look, when he took the job, people were like, why is he getting into broadcasting? Doesn't he want to be a coach? And then, you know, some people are like, well, this is a good opportunity. So more people you're like on, on top of people's minds. And then when he took the Canada job, even Jimmy and Charlie were like, bro, are you serious? Well, you're going to take that job. And I, there's part of me that loves the. Like, oh, oh, you thought it was a bad idea, huh? And it's like my stock is now at another level because the the pride that he has in in just uh, having success. Uh, look, and, and as a coach, well, a lot of people have doubted him. But then on top of that, he's also he's also singing Oh Canada as well. My man learned he learned the national anthem, which is not something we usually see from foreign head coaches. People of, of countries. know Oh Canada beyond Oh Canada. I, that's <laughs> yeah, all like, I got. <laughs> OK, I need to go to, you know, rap genius and get the lyrics. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I did not know there was more to it. But um, no, this is a, a huge uh, win. Obviously, Schaffelberg getting the, the early goal in, uh, against Venezuela. And then also the mistake, the, the goal from from Solomon Rondon, obviously unbelievable. And to, to hit the ball, I, I think it was like 30, 40 yards or something like that uh, over over Cripo. But there's. There was something, you know, uh, we, you were talking about the Canada back line, but there's something to even the midfield. There's a confidence. Uh, uh, Estacchio, who I think plays, does he play in Portugal? I forgot what he plays. I believe so. Or I'm making um, it up. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just like, yo, th these dudes are like, they're no joke, man. Yeah, he plays for Porto. Um, um, it, I feel like we saw these early rumblings of like a new Canada. And they were far more quality than we've seen in the past. And I feel like we've seen this probably over the last very few years where they seem to have made great strides that I don't know what had been going on, especially with the managerial shift, right? Like, obviously, it's very challenging. 
to teach at the, uh, to teach, to coach at the national level, um, because you are kind of, I call it babysitter, right? Because like wherever the players are at club, essentially like that's mom and dad, because they're impacting your day to day, your training, your everything else that goes into making you and the player that you are. And then you get these scant minutes with, you know, your national team coach and you hope to show out, but like you get such little time to imprint upon players and try to, uh, change or cultivate that you always wonder, you know, how do you do? And we know what Jesse Marsh, Marsh's, um, record had been for club, but you know, what was it going to be, you know, yeah, for a first a, team? There's a, there's a, um, this is why I applaud Canada. I mean, there's, there's been a scrappiness that I think the U S didn't show They're They're adapting to the, the, the difficulty. I mean, we saw, uh, the even just the amount of fouls receiving them uh, uh doling them out you know what i mean like the uh, not Jeffers, even saying Jeff- sorry not even you got you can't say <laughs> sorry you can no more sorry all right that's it we're done we're past the sorry stage all right and that is where i think canada is I, and not to say that the us didn't play with a lot of like heart or whatever but they, there's there's a, a scrappiness that i think we're not sort of used to especially when canada plays uh S- south american teams cuz you just assume they're going to be kind of like the, the you know, outclass in, in the quality. Like Canada hasn't scored a bunch of goals, but they haven't given up a lot either. They're not making a ton of mistakes. They're just like, this is a, what it seems like Jesse Marsh has brought. Like we, we criticize Greg, Ber- not even criticize, but we point out that Greg Burrell halter, that all, all the players love playing for him. They would run through a wall for him. There's like, he's brought the guys closer together. And, we don't hear any of that with Jesse Marsh. It does. It just sounds a little bit more like, oh no, he's just like you a dog. All right, you win. And you're so not you, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> we, I can't. I the, can't mess with you. <laughs> the dressing room is just like Lord of the Flies. He's like, no, yeah, Who's yeah. Bare knuckle boxing. Pe- Who wants people, to start? Uh, everybody. He's like, yo, I need. Give me your best. I show speed. Bark. And he's like, all right, you good. You win. Because <laughs> that's what um I uh, that that's what has been surprising. And and even when they. Uh, when Venezuela tied the game, I was just like, oh, this is it. This is over for Canada. And and uh, they ended up winning in penalties. And, you know, it felt also uh, young Hel- uh, Herrera, who uh, play, played for NYCFC, uh, ended up going to Spain. He plays at, 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 at Girona now. But uh, and weirdly enough, I-, I was watching his penalty and I'm like, dude, I want I just I want you to make your penalty, not only because he played for NYCFC, but because I actually bumped into him in Amalfi Coast for my honeymoon. I was at this resort in Amalfi Coast and I'm sitting next to, uh, I'm having breakfast and I see Young Hell Herrera there. And as soon as I saw Young Hell Herrera there, I said, I'm in a place that is way too expensive. I should not be here. If Young Hell Herrera is here, <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a La Liga player here, I have overspent on my honeymoon. And and you're like, um, <laughs> Excuse me, uh, Mr. Herrera. I'm I'm a fan, and the land is like Christian. <laughs> Dude, I was uh, yeah, so I was emotionally invested in that penalty for for many many reasons. Um, so uh, but no, uh, 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 impressive uh win for uh for Canada. They end up playing Argentina next. Uh, I think I believe at MetLife. Can't imagine it'll go too well for Canada there, but if they can hold their own, uh, anything can happen. We saw Messi missed his penalty uh, in their game. Again, anything can happen. So uh, we shall anything see. Anything can yeah. happen, but I mean, they did beat Canada 2 0 back in June. Right. So, exactly. I so. mean, <laughs> and they also outshot them. I guess that speaks more to like the Canada's defense and, and goalkeeping than anything. But yeah, yeah. It should be interesting. Also, like Argentina are not new here, it's their fifth straight Copa Semi. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're g- gonna be fine. But um, we love the underdog, so like, <laughs> come on, go. Canada. <laughs> so uh, the other match that was uh, the, you know, the interesting as well was uh, Uruguay and Brazil. Um, there was a red card in this game that was also kind of wild. Uh, I mean, he nearly I forgot the guy's name, but he he nearly destroyed um, uh, Rodrigo's ankle. Uh, what was his name that did the uh, the challenge? I forgot his name. Uh-huh. Uh, Damn. Oh, Nandez, Nandez. Uh, yeah. A common ball fight club classic. <laughs> um, Add it to the lore. The interesting thing here was obviously um, Vinny Jr. Uh, was out in this game uh, c- due to yellow card accumulation. But Endrick, um, who is, I believe, 17, uh, started in his place. He's going to Real Madrid uh, uh, this coming season. 
I did not know this, and I didn't. I was watching the entire game, and I did not realize this. But Hendrick only took he took one shot, and he only completed one pass. The pass at kickoff in the first whistle. That's all he did. <laughs> Which is, I've never even heard of that. <laughs> never in my life have I heard of a player being that terrible. Uh, or, or just that ineffective uh, on a match. He barely, he, he received the ball a couple times and I saw him, you know, lose the ball. He got fouled a bit. And there was, you know, uh, Araujo, um, um, he, uh, he like shoulder checked him or whatever. It was like a big deal. It led to a little bit of a scuffle. But I've never heard of a player completing w- play and playing 90 minutes and only completing one pass. It's unbelievable. I've never heard of it. Now you're going to make me watch this absolute <laughs> chaos match back just to see I, how it works. I... Because sometimes, like, that's by design, right? You want to limit someone's touches. And I've seen that get through, like, I'd say a full first half where you see, like, a target person that's only had, like, seven touches all game so far, which yeah. is shocking. But it's like, are they unable to get involved or are they being intentionally stifled? Right. I mean, his how many touches did he have? He had 23 touches. In That's the game, still very very low. It's very very low, but t- to not complete a pass is crazy. It's your, it's Brazil. People are calling you the next Pele and all this stuff. There's clearly a lot of expectation, and he 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 just had one of the worst games uh, that he's ever had. I mean, U- Uruguay, I thought even going into this game uh, with a better team, and you saw in the game, the Brazil Colombia game, the last game of the group stage, ev- it ended nil nil, but you saw Brazil playing hard. Because they're like, we got to score here. We do not want to play Uruguay. We do not want to play yeah, Uruguay. Yeah, no. <laughs> and you, Uruguay, you saw the like, urgency there. Uruguay have won this competition 15 times. And yeah. granted, this is their first time in the semis since winning in 2011. But <laughs> it's anybody's game. They just they yeah. know how to play. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it led to, I don't know if you saw the comments from Bielsa. Oh, as yeah. Well, which... I saw them. I objectively subjectively i love bielsa so let me get that out of the way first Mm -hmm. um i i think he's right in his sentiment for sure i I agree i felt the same way and there's something poetic it's 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 similar to the way eric Cantona talks about the the sport as well where it's very you can see the 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 emotion behind it and you know they're not focused on money and the business of it and the glitz and the glamour and that's what bielsa's comments kind of echoed yeah, I, I mean, that too, but I just feel like we've gotten so wrapped up in um, in tactics that mm-hmm. you create a lot of teams, not everybody, there are very good managers out there who are capable of creating structure, but then letting their players play freely because they understand the structure that they're playing in. So it gives you a lot more room to be creative and things of that nature. But I feel like with the over-structurization, I guess, of football now, um, it kills a lot of the creativity of the game because you're so focused on, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. I go run back. I pass ball back. I go forward. I will say this. And I think Bielsa, his comments make more sense for South America. You know, you see the way the players play. The, you saw the aggression. You saw some hard fouls. And you see the way Copa America is refereed versus how it, the Euros are refereed. And you could have a little bit more fun with the, you can creatively punch a guy in South America, <laughs> in Copa America, <laughs> in a way that really the referees won't get that upset. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they they'll they'll let some uh, head the the headbutt uh, uh, Canada Panama that nothing got. Uh, uh, yeah. co- no, not, it wasn't Panama. I forgot what team, but the uh, Canada, uh, um, uh, you know, a red that probably should have happened uh, or whatever. But it's it's those. Um, I think it's the, like. I, I saw, you know, uh, uh, Alexi Lalas respond to that as well. And, and Alexi k- responded in the way you think he exactly responded, right? He sort of came at it with yeah. the like, oh, he, he did the, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically like, oh, you know, Bielsa has become a millionaire uh, due to this game. So clearly there's been like something good. You know, it's not, it's the, you know, he's made a lot of money. Uh, uh, because of the growth of the game, and it's it, isn't that it's, the whole point and the antithesis of Bielsa's comment? I mean, Bielsa as a manager, he also ingrains himself in the communities that he's part of. So he actually is—he's not a voyeur when he's coaching yeah. in these places. He knows the people. He'll say hi. He'll, I think that he has a lot of that 
very like romanticized sentiment and I understand where it comes from, but it also is like very like character based. And yeah. so like not everything is going to come down to money. He's an excellent manager. I love him. If we do like the grand Bielsa hierarchy family tree of players right, right. and managers that have sprouted off because of him, it's remarkable. So yeah. like there's some magic in that. But yeah, yeah, I do think that we have over commodified a lot of things. We've made big business trump a lot of football. It should always be football and football business, not business that runs football. Yeah, yeah. But this is it's 2024 and anything that you can yield a profit from, you're going to drain every last gasp of air from its lungs. Yeah, there's a there's a weird like the reason I respect Bielsa a lot is because it re reminds me of a lot of um like artists and comedians that I know, whether musicians or whatever, like, you know, those, those hardcore diehard people, like people that are, that die for their art and they love it and they, but they've made no money. They, they're just like, this is what, this is how it's supposed to be and whatever. And it's just like, so they're, they're, ju they're just like super authentic and true and righteous about their own art. And that's what Biel Bielsa feels that way, but also managed to make millions of dollars. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I like, mean, sometimes it, it just works out that way. But like, right. you know, it's funny because one of the most validating things that any pro player has ever said was actually Thierry Henry when he was asked, um, what would you be doing if you weren't a pro football player? And he said, I'd be an amateur football player. <laughs> and like, yeah. As an amateur football player who has played since I was four, who genuinely, I love the game, everything about it. It's part of me. It's part of my identity. It, it's everything to me. I understand having the sentiment of being like, yeah, okay, I can make money from it. And I guess I do. But like, that was never the driving factor. Trust me, I was making way more money in finance. Right, but right. Like, <laughs> that doesn't negate the fact that football itself has a heart and soul. And there's a lot of us that end up being torchbearers that end up being like ambassadors to the game because we are so excited and love it so much. And like it gets people interested. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look, there is a clearly a, a business to we work in the business of it. Yeah. Um, but there is there's something to um, the you know, and I guess after meeting so many players and, and they are you realize, oh, they are people just like us. They just happen to be very good at this one particular thing. But you see the. Um, the 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 abuse and uh, not that they not that, not that they take yes on their bodies and the phys what they have to do but the, also the the amount of games that they're required to play all these tournaments the and commitment to everything all the time that people do not realize nutrition workout sleep, yeah TikTok. simple things simple you gotta things do like, the you gotta <laughs> simple things okay. actually the old guard would criticize the young guard <laughs> for the TikToks because you're supposed to have a singular focus and it's like okay grandpa. No, Let's yeah. go feeding your 5 p.m. porridge. You bet. Did you like, see, I don't know if you saw Trinity Rodman doing uh, TikToks with with fans after a spirit game. Okay? I missed that. No, the, I, yeah, I can only was... watch so much football and work <laughs> and sleep, Christian. Ah. It, it's, uh, I mean, you're slipping, Kubo. I know. Uh, but sorry. No. <laughs> I got to update my TikTok scroll before I go to bed. Just like pass out drooling no. on myself. But that's that's what it sort of requires. I mean, I think the uh, because of social media and the connection that fans feel with with clubs, with players, that there's there's only we're we're only asking more of players than we were 20, 30 years ago. It's not less. I mean, people can't think that that's the case. So it, it, it's a it's something. Look, has it has it you know, when it comes to all of that part, like, you know, the what we're asking of the players as individuals, but then also tactically what games are looking like, looking like, you know, people sort of blame Pep Guardiola for like you because you were so successful at this. Now everybody's sort of trying to copy it. And now we have these carbon copies of of like Man City and they can't they can't really replicate it. You're not getting the same beautiful football. You're not seeing players uh, 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 express themselves like you, you heard, you know, Clint Dempsey told when when the U.S. lost uh, uh, in Copa America kind of mentioned that as well. It's just like a player like would a player like Clint Dempsey come up nowadays right it, with with the way the, the, the rosters are built and with the the skill set that they have like having a player that is just like yo i'm gonna do my thing and i'm gonna i'm gonna you know i'm gonna cut you up if you if you even yeah. just give me the opportunity i mean like even the nature of the game has evolved so much right so yeah. if, if you think back like in a little bit it, it's so cyclical because if you go back to like way early days of like italian football where it was like you know we're just gonna slot this guy and like we'll move left to right and like save the substitutions and you need to be able to play everywhere like that multifaceted tool, right? And that was thought of eventually as this like antiquated notion. 
And now we have the inverted wing back and we have, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, you know what I mean? Like, so it, it's like, you need a, you need these, a protractor to goddamn figure they out these cha- p- yeah, positions. They, <laughs> they change, but it's like, it's almost like they change so much that they revert back in a lot of ways where it's like, oh, well, you're an attacker, you're a defender, you're everything. Right, you're, right, right. Um, and, and that's why Italy got bounced out of the euros right christine <laughs> no italy got bounced out of the euros because there's a lot of other systemic issues and <laughs> because the dominican sensation the dominican sensation ruben vargas was just like nah bro sorry italia but dr has to it got to be put on the map right now okay that's what happened right yes christian for you <laughs> He said, this is from my boy. I know you're sitting up in New York. I got to give a shout out to the Cooligans, Christian Polanco. That's that right. That bangers for you. Mm, you love to see it. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. the uh, I, I want to wrap up. Uh, the last thing, last two things. England and Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland so Switzerland lose uh, in penalties to England. I'm so upset. Um, and my not dear really the- sweet Shaka. Shaka scores the goal, which is great to see. Um, but then penalties and I, I all all the England players uh, made their penalties and they had, I believe, five black players take the penalties, including Cole Palmer. Uh, if, you, if, if you know, you know. Uh, so uh, but this was a lot of pressure, especially we all remember the, the last Euros and at the final against Italy uh, that, uh, you know, where especially Chiellini was like, he just knew people were going to miss. He was like, nah, I don't see. He, he was just confident that, uh, you know, Donnarumma was going to stop and uh, and England players were going to miss. But the the vitriol afterwards, and there was just the 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 people, they, they have a little, everybody they, they, in England, I don't know what happened. They have a little a little racism box at home and and they they open it as soon as England are taking penalties and they're like hey okay now now's the time to pull this out and and th- this is what the, the 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 saddest part of it even during the penalties cuz we know what happened before during the penalties i'm just like bro please make the penalties because the racismo is going to be crazy if y'all miss yeah i mean it's so <laughs> bad because you say like the racismo box gets opened but also like the domestic violence box gets opened as well, yeah. which mm-hmm. when you as a nation need to remind people to like, I don't know, not abuse your partners because your team lost the game. It's kind of wild. So yeah, it's just like the worst possible conflation of events where I personally would love to see England lose all the time, but I think that Sokka specifically deserves the world. And so um, one, twofold, right? I love him. I'm a gooner. <laughs> Three, I never want to see anybody get racially abused because they miss a pen or at all. But like, it's so wild to me that like that needs to be in your thoughts as you're watching game, which should be enjoyable, irrespective of how it plays out. Like, yeah, you'll be disappointed. But for that to be like option box one where they're like, right, right. Mm, uh, let the view view. <laughs> It's uh, it's surreal, and it and it's becoming more and more a uh, you know, especially a social media problem where like we're sort of seeing this as well in MLS when when a player fouls Messi kind of hard, and if he ha- happens to be a black player, it's the comments are absurd. They just go to their uh, you know, they basically just attack this uh, 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 the player uh, on on Instagram or on Twitter, and it's just, I mean, we all. Sane people know that it shouldn't happen and it should, uh, you know, I, I, there's nothing I'm going to say to make people stop that. I, I can't <laughs> imagine there was a Cooligans listener that's like, you know what? I was going to be super racist, but Christian was like, Christian and Christine were like, yo, don't do that. Yeah. And I was like, you you know what? You right. That's not that's probably not that's our kind audience. Of, that's kind of a weird <laughs> champagne problem to have. Like, thank God everyone that you know, listens in to the Cooligans yeah. and or the citizens of the People's Republic of Langola of course, managed the best to like people, best people. <laughs> be very open and loving and yes, that's the, that's the community we're trying to foster. So uh, yeah, so uh, a wild overall at the Euros and uh, and at Copa America. The last thing we'll wrap up here, um, especially we have uh, uh, a Woso expert. Uh, in here. So what we didn't get a chance to talk about this last week because it was uh, very, very new in the news. Um, but the San Diego Wave are very much in the news uh, for a terrible, terrible reason. Uh, and it is because of a uh, so a former employee alleged uh, essentially that uh, th- th- it was just a, um, a toxic 
work place, toxic work environment, very, very poor treatment, lots of emotional abuse. I mean, and it's not just, it wasn't just one employee. I saw several uh, uh, online and it's, it started this uh, bigger conversation and it also feels like it might even be a lawsuit as well. So we also have to be uh, careful with how we uh, discuss this, but uh, we just want to make sure uh, that we do talk about it. And, and um, because the main thing here is, um, by name, uh, Jill Ellis was called out as as somebody who is, um, you know, allowing this behavior. I, I, I forgot her exact role. She's team president uh, of San Diego Wave. I don't know the exact title, but she's boss lady. She she has a lot of say. And uh, so obviously the the former U.S. Women's National Team coach uh, went uh, to the San Diego Wave to start that club. Uh, they started about, what, three years ago, I believe, two or three years ago. Yeah, maybe two. I think it was the second season. Um, but. This is, uh, and I can, I, what I'll say about my, this is just strictly from me uh, directly. I, in, from everything I've heard and consumed of like people talking about Jill Ellis, whether that's Sydney LaRue who has made comments in the past, whether that is uh, Ali Krieger who was talking about uh, basically saying like, you don't, you don't know where you stand with Jill Ellis. And this is why she left her off of the women's national team roster, essentially from uh, after winning the world cup in 2015 till uh, almost like three, four months prior to the, the 2019 world cup. So in general, the, the amount of evidence that we have about poor treatment from Jill Ellis is definitely more than positive, you know, news about Jill Ellis. So that's sort of, what we know, and we've seen comments from. So Sydney Larue did make a comment about it, and 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 essentially supported the 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 first employee that made uh, uh, the allegation. And then Alex Morgan did also also made a statement, um, kind of just saying the uh, you know I'll read a little bit of it. She says I am disappointed to hear about the allegations made by multiple former Wave FC employees today. As players, we have worked hard to build a team that is surrounded by an inclusive, positive, and safe environment. But it's important to me that we are creating that environment for both players and staff throughout the entire organization. Uh, and it continues uh, to just you know say more sort of optimistic stuff about the future of um, of the program there. But the uh, it's it's you know I, I, we obviously can't go too crazy with what we sort of say here. But more than anything, is that you see these details and you see the statement from the wave and they, at least for me i there's nothing but disappointment this is like you know the wave made a statement just seemed it's just completely dismissive which doesn't seem like the right approach um but your your thoughts on on sort of where this is and maybe what this speaks to uh you know maybe end of itself still has a long way to go yeah i think that um with the Yates report being still recent and just like a massive blemish on NWSL, you would have hoped that a lot of the behaviors, whether they be physical, emotional, uh, mental or otherwise, because I think that part of the allegations by the first employee focused specifically on um, mental health and the impact on long-term mental health um, for them. And obviously that's those are all current allegations that have been made. Um, now, like, what will be done in terms of repairing that or having somebody on staff or what the specific, specific the specificity of that is in terms of um, what transpired to um, that employee and others at the wave that they're alleging is is serious, right? You yeah. um, you definitely don't want to have any sort of like negative connotation, especially since you know the league has presumably dealt with a lot of coercion and things that were just unscrupulous practices that we thought had been put to bed in this new shiny sort of frontier of women's soccer, especially in in this country. And the growth of NWSL is so good. That you hate to see, especially at any of the clubs, but like at one of the more recent expansion sides, um, especially in the wake of like some recent managerial decisions, like the dismissal of Casey Stoney. Yeah, yeah. So you start to wonder, like, well, what is actually going on over there? Um, Alex Morgan's statement. Um, obviously, if she says she's been an advocate, she'll continue to be an advocate. Um, it doesn't negate the fact that there have been other players, yes, in the past that have been isolated from this incident that have been very outspoken about Jill Ellis. Um, 
and until they investigate or figure out if there is something to investigate over there. Um, I don't think we'll see much shake out of it, but um, I hope that they do sort of acknowledge a problem if there is one and make the appropriate adjustment. Nobody should have to work in an environment where they don't feel supported and safe. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, uh, this is why I say, and I did mention like NWSL, and NWSL has been in the news for uh, similar types of issues, I guess, workplace issues. But I, I, I don't necessarily want to highlight and say like it, it's an NWSL problem, and because this is a common workplace problem across uh, lots of different types of jobs and and in different fields. I think we have this perception because we see these like superstar players and the the club and game day and 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 we just assume that it's probably like a fun place to work uh, but i think this highlights like what it's like to work in sports in mm-hmm. general right it is it is a a, a different type of envi- environment that work hours are weird the expectations are weird the 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 like the the, the time where you have to like you're 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 making memes. You're making graphics. Yeah, everybody, so f- photographers, videographers, people are editing and at all these odd hours and stuff like that. And then the demands uh, that they put on staff are very very high. Um, and and so I've heard similar stories not solely from NWSL. It's like it's also been uh, across uh, men's clubs as well. So it's not uh, uh, like unheard of. But th- this is where I think. And and I applaud the bravery of 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 employees making this stuff known. And again, it's all allegations. We 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 are, we're all waiting to figure out what the the final sort of decision is going to be. But uh, this is where I credit the bravery of those employees to just essentially say like, we cannot stand for this kind of behavior. I get that the job is flashy and it's cool and everybody wants to work here and blah, 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 but it can't be. The job is also demanding and hard work and long hours and blurred lines and all of that. So yeah, yeah, like I get it. Like the one, it's very hard to differentiate like how and why people decide to, but it seems like these individuals, at least the ones that I've seen that have set up, really have been involved in soccer and genuinely love it. And that part, I genuinely feel um, horrible for them because who yeah. wants to ever have to walk away from something, a job, an environment, people, a community that they love um, based on maybe a few allegedly bad actors. Of course, of course. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll wait for more news uh, on that, and uh, we'll give it people updates if, if we hear anything. Uh, but uh, Christine Cupo, thank you so much uh, for joining me. As always, appreciate it. Uh, you'll be back on Thursday as well. I don't know if we're going to be in studio. We'll see what these COVID uh, test results uh, you say. Keep, you keep testing, Christian. <laughs> I will ready the laptop and my mic. <laughs> I'll be exactly. back in Charlie's studio again. You'll uh, just you'll be in the studio with a hazmat suit <laughs> if necessary. Uh, <laughs> but Christine, let people know where they can follow you and and where they can watch uh, your show and your work. Yes, of course. Um, you can follow me on w- the artist formerly known as Twitter uh, X at C Kubo. Um, a little less active than I've been in the po, Um at Miss Kubo on IG and of course on CBS Sports Golazzo Network on P Plus on Attacking Third and NWSL coverage, um, occasionally some and uh, other morning footy and other leagues. I cover everything. What do you, you want do to do? It, you do I it don't all. sleep. But yeah, watch the Lotto <laughs> Network on Okay, P-Plug. careful. Uh, careful, CBS. We were just talking about taking advantage of your employees and doing, making them do too much. So that hopefully <laughs> CBS is treating you right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, everybody, thank you again uh, for tuning in. We'll be back on Thursday. Like I said, uh, uh, Christine will be joining us. Uh, make sure you follow us at Taco Cooligans on all social channels. Uh, follow Yahoo Sports uh, as well. Shout out to the Yahoo uh, team. And uh, yeah, we'll be back on Thursday. Obviously, there'll be a couple more matches in uh, the Euros and Copa America that we will cover. Uh, So we have a lot more to discuss. Thank you again for tuning in, everybody. Peace.